kdo tady nerozumí anglicky? Great. So nobody who needs translation. So we will do the, uh, the talk in English. I, uh, my name is Andrej Hrab. I am director of uh, Arca Theatre. And uh, on my left side is Christine de Costa, a managing director of Ultima Ves. And uh, we decided to make the talk not so much about the piece you saw yesterday or you will see tonight or tomorrow. We will talk more about the role of the art institution in, uh, in the neighborhood, in, uh, in the community you are part of and uh, uh, with the problems we now are dealing in, in Europe. Um, Ultima Ves uh, moved to Molenbeek and maybe all of you heard about Molenbeek, you read in the newspaper, you maybe saw some uh, TV news about Molenbeek and we will try to go behind this media uh, image and uh, maybe we, will, so we can start with the trial of, uh, of the uh, inauguration of their new uh, studio uh, just in the in 2012 before Molenbeek was announced as a as a seat of jihadism of Europe. Mensen in de studio kwamen kijken wat wij aan het doen waren. Nu, je ziet, het gebouw is transparant. Mensen kunnen kijken uh, wat zijn die aan het doen of wat zijn anderen aan het doen. Ga gerust overal naartoe, alle deuren staan open, herken het gebouw. En ook in de toekomst, jullie zijn altijd leuk. We are at home now, opposite rows, yes. Let's go. Yeah. Beachy, but... From the images you could see that uh, beside the dancers, musicians, you could see also kids from the, from the street. And that's probably uh, something new also for, uh, for Ultima Ves, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is or not? It <laughs> is and it's not. Well, it is in Molenbeek. So in, in 2008, 
we uh, had a studio in another part of Brussels capital region in XL, which is a very, it's a rather rich um, neighborhood. And we, we knew we were going to lose that space. We rented it and we were looking for another place to have a studio and have our offices. Um, Molenbe um, Brussels capital region includes 19 communes, the, Brus the center of Brussels and 18 communes around the center of Brussels. And when looking for a studio, it was not our first idea to go to Molenbeek. We looked everywhere where we could find the right place, a place without pillars, a place big enough to have a studio, including offices and, if possible, even a second studio. But in one way or another, maybe um, it was foreseen that we would land in Molenbeek because, first of all, Molenbeek has a history of being a commune with, at the same time, people living and industry. And by that I mean that there is a lot of houses and buildings in Molenbeek that have in the front just a normal house. So when you walk in the streets, you see houses. But be behind the houses, in most of the streets of Molenbeek, there are big, big spaces where um, factories are based. Still today, that's still today. But it has a, a long history of that. So in one way or another, to find the right space there was a big chance we would find it in Molenbeek. A second reason to find a studio there was because Molenbeek is one of the poorest communes of the Brussels capital region. So to find a space we would be able to pay, the chances were high we would find it there, and we did. But at the same time, we had a little history with Molenbeek already because our office was not linked with our studio in the other commune in, Brus in the Brussels capital region. It was already in Molenbeek. We had an office in Molenbeek, just the office. And uh, we had already some partnerships with organizations in Molenbeek, such as uh, the Fanfa Kids, an organization, social artistic project actually, with young children in Molenbeek playing music and we had already made a project with them, uh, a, a show, including them as the musicians and having um, performers on stage. So when we knew we were going to have our base in Molenbeek, we were thinking a lot about how to do that. Molenbeek is very known now in the whole world for the wrong reasons, but Molenbeek has always been in, in Brussels itself known as a as a commune with um, certain problematics, such as a very poor population, um, a very high uh, unemployment level, um, many families, a lot of Moroccan families also uh, without father figure, um, schools, that uh, Dutch speaking schools and French schools with high uh, concentration of um, children not speaking the language of the school. Uh, for example, Dutch schools with maybe, let's say, 90% of the children coming from families not speaking Dutch at home. Uh, so, voila, a lot of problematic issues that we all know in Molenbeek. At the same time, Molenbeek has always been a commune with a lot of um, very nice things as well. Uh, when we did a walk there uh, to prepare our going to our new home, the guide who accompanied us told us that actually you can compare Molenbeek with um, a place where someone has ripped or broken a pearl of, of um, uh, uh, no, um, how do you say that, um, uh, ketting? Uh, no. oh. chain, a chain of pearls and all the pearls have been flying around and are now all over the city. And uh, meaning that there are a lot of beautiful uh, initiatives in Molenbeek, social artistic initiatives, social art, uh, initiative, em emancipative initiatives, to, to do something about the problematics of Molenbeek. All beautiful projects, but a little bit spread out, not with uh, uh, enough coherence. So this was a situation when we moved and we decided, and I say this in, with the words of Wim, not to land as a UFO and just have our little isolated tower where we would do 
art and be busy with art, but have the doors open, as Wim said in the video, have the doors open to the outside world and look for partnerships in Molenbeek with organizations that already had um, the connections with the population and with different levels of the population, children, youngsters, women, schools, and to, to, to look for partnerships with those organizations exchanging what they have as experience and offering our experience a discipline where you don't need language, where you need your body to communicate, which is um, an option for uh, or a big potential for a universal uh, exchange and language. Um, in the year preparing our uh, moving towards Molenbeek, we uh, contacted and we visited many, like 20 organizations. There was also a university student do doing uh, a thesis about um, us going to move to Molenbeek and the possibilities, potential for collaborations with uh, partners, partners in Molenbeek. So it was, it was a very nice time to discover actually what was living in Molenbeek and to dream and think about possible connections with some of these organizations and, as such, the population of Molenbeek. We moved in June um, 2012, and it's quite amazing that in the first year um, working there already, we had more projects and exchange than we would have even been hoping to, to dream of. Uh, now we are three and a half years further and we have structural um, partnerships with schools, with organizations that work with children, youngsters, with other organizations that do specific projects with whom we work for not all of their work, but part of their work and part of their um, groups of people they work with. Of course, our main, our core activity is and remains the artistic work of Wim van der Kerbus, making shows with dancers from all over the world. Uh, in the show you have already seen here, or you will see tonight, there are dancers from uh, Russia, uh, Slovakia, France, um, um, United, uh, United Kingdom, England. United Kingdom. We have, not in this show, but in the other one we are touring, in spite of wishing and wanting, which is hopefully going to come to Prague um, maybe this year still, or the beginning of next year, we have a Moroccan dancer who has also performed in Talk to the Demon, the piece we premiered here uh, last year. Last year, yes. No, two years ago, actually. 2014? No, 15? No, yes, last year. 14, no. <laughs> um, a, a Moroccan big dancer living in Molenbeek and um, uh, joining our company two years ago. Wait, where was I? What was I going to say? Um, that we have mm. a lot of dancers from all over the world, including now people from Molenbeek participating artistically with Ultima Ves. Did I answer your question? Maybe I took a long way, huh? No, no, I, I think it's, uh, it's quite important because it's, uh, I think uh, we have to question the social responsibility of the art institution. That's something what, uh, uh, without these questions, uh, uh, we would not be able to proceed in, uh, in our existence. We, we would not even do to prove our existence in, in the world. We, ha we are in Prague, of course, in different uh, situations. We have to deal with different problems. No, we, uh, we are in the center of the city, but at the same time, we have to react on the development of society. We have to react on, uh, on the uh, uh, really radical change in, uh, in the society, how the society is divided so radically in uh, in the last few months so uh, for us it's very important to to hear this uh, mm. that uh, not only the like uh, the production house like arca theater but also the company has to prove this uh, social responsibility uh, towards the community they work with but uh, yeah living in brussels it's it's 
by definition, by, by definition, living with different communities. I mean, we have uh, Brussels is on the territory of the Flemish community, but um, the languages spoken in Brussels and the nationalities being represented in Brussels are incredible. I have friends who did an artistic project in their streets. Uh, trying to find out how many nationalities lived in their streets. And they came up to more than 50, 50 nationalities in their street in somewhere in Brussels. It's amazing that you can imagine that 50 residents uh, of, fi of 50, I mean, not 50, that in your street there are residents in your own country of 50 different nationalities, it's, it's amazing. So we are, in a way, we used to that. We find it normal to hear different languages in, in Brussels, to see different colors in, in the streets, to, to live with different communities, different cultural backgrounds, different religions. I'm not saying that this is always without problems because well, um, we knew Molenbeek was having problematic issues to deal with. Um, now the whole world knows that. And it's not that we can say that there are no problems. It, there is a problem. But th this doesn't mean that Molenbeek is a hell place, or like Donald Trump said, Brussels is a hell hole. Mm -hmm. Brussels is as beautiful as ever. Um, has problems, yeah, but and they have been become visible. But it, we should definitely not give in to to um, the perception that 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 should lead to a psychosis of fear. This this is really something we have to resist. If not, we just um, give in to to what terror wants. Well, uh, but when we see the images of Molenbeek uh, in our newspaper or in TV news, we see empty streets, the policemen on the street, uh, nobody is, is going to cafes, and uh, uh, so is it is it like this uh, really, or did it change since Paris or not? I mean, something changed in our minds. Yeah. That's that's for sure. But these images that we could all see in the press, it was amazing. We had a um, reportage uh, two days after um, the attack, the um, lockdown in Brussels, with showing us the photos that we had all seen in the media in the previous days, and the same images at the same moment, the same time, the same location, seen from another perspective, and it was amazing. So, for example, um, the person who had made this, this documentary showed the image of that the media had shown, let's say, from a uh, tank being uh, in, the, in front of the opera house, standing there with a soldier and a big gun, which an, is an image we did not know at all in Brussels. And then the same time, the same location, the same tank seen from another perspective, very small, in a corner, and the, the, the same location, full of people, the same moment. So we have to be really aware that when we follow the media and we see all these images, it's a lot about perception. Were the streets empty? Well, yes, the two days of the what they have has been called the Brussels lockdown, I live in the center, and um, it's true that there was a difference. Why? Because all the cafes and the restaurants and all the public spaces got closed because of terror level number four. But in fact, that, that was the only reason why there was a difference. Um, our children could not go to school, not because something happened, nothing happened in Belgium. Nothing happened in Molenbeek, nothing happened in Brussels. There was no bomb, there was nothing. It's just that our government, because of all the things happening, judged that it was unsafe for people to take public transport. Because people cannot, and wh when people cannot take public transport, they cannot go to work, they cannot go to school. 
But of course, this, this created a feeling of total uh, unsafety for certain people, thinking our children cannot go to school. This has never happened in, <laughs> never. So this could make people afraid. So the potential of danger and the measurements taken to protect the population created a real feeling of fear. So it's a paradoxical situation that, of course, we understand that the governments had to take measurements, but we have to be aware and consci conscious of the fact that um, we don't give in to, to uh, a fear that is, that is created by a situation more than, 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 than a real danger. I mean, it's maybe delicate to say because, of course, it's terrible what happened in Paris. Um, someone in the media said that the real victims of Paris were, of course, the, the people who got killed and their families, but also the refugees. They became victims also of what happened in Paris because suddenly there was a whole atmosphere of, of fear against strangers coming in, um, Islam, and what it stands for in, in the perception. Um, whereas these people were, f were escaping their country for a real reason. And Europe only um, welcomes, if Europe already welcomes them, not all countries, a very small percentage of the refugees. I mean, most refugees are a refugee in their own country. There is 11 million people in Syria that have had to escape their house because it was bombed or it doesn't exist Im anymore or because they were chased. 11 million people, but only 4 million, well, 7 million are still in, their, in the country, but they are in other regions. 4 million are out, but most of them, 90% I think of them, are um, in Turkey and Lebanon not in the rest of Europe. So, uh, yeah, what, what do we talk about? Um, and what would happen, how would we feel if that would happen to us, if there is maybe an, a nature uh, cause that makes we cannot live in our ho house anymore? How would we feel having to escape our country for a real reason that makes it impossible for us to live in a safe way in our own house? I mean, it's all questions that should be looked at um, calmly and with serenity and that yeah, become issues that have to be um, dealt with globally and not with fear, but with humanity, I would say. That's um, the, the challenge we are confronted with. Yeah, and uh, well, how uh, do you think that uh, the perception of, for instance, of your work has been changed since then? We, we were talking ab uh, about uh, uh, in spite of wishing and wanting, which we brought in 1999. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe 2000, I don't know. So, some years ago. And now is a revival of this show with a totally new cast, but also with uh, probably new uh, reception of the audience, how, how it works. Like um, so, In Spite of Wishing and Wanting was made 16 years ago uh, with male dancers only, um, music of David Byrne. I must say my story, because David Byrne was here in Arca Theatre and uh, we were talking, having coffee together and he looked at a poster of Ultima Vez and said, well, I like this guy. I saw him in New York, it's great. And I said, well, maybe it would be good to, to do something mm -hmm. together and we should co-produce it. And we never got the money for that. <laughs> so <That's laughs> We made the peace with but it. But uh, the peace <laughs> at the end uh, happened and we did uh, 100, uh, uh, we celebrated the 100 uh, um, performance. performance of that. 
So it was made 16 years ago, and we, revi we started wor reviving it in November of last year. Um, the, the piece has remained the same, but of course the performers have changed. It's a new cast. And Wim has um, chosen people in function of, well, people we, that were already working with us. Amongst them, the Moroccan dancer from Talk to the Demon, who lives in Molenbeek, just around our corner. And he got a particular role in the piece, um, other dancers, other roles. And suddenly, with all the events in the happening around us, we realized that maybe the piece is not explicit, but implicitly political, polit political in a way that we did not see 16 years ago, or that we did not experience in the same way 16 years ago, and which had not been a reason for us to revive the peace in the first place. But given the circumstances and the events, we suddenly realized, wow, there is a dimension that appears now, an extra dimension that we did not um, create on purpose, but it happens also because for many reasons, for the, 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 the text that is said in the piece, for the people who say it in the piece. Um, there is also a funny thing, hap well, funny thing. Um, when Wim created it in 99, he made a film and not a decor. The film is projected during the performance in two, um, at two moments. And there is no decor, but there is a few um, little accessoires, let's say. One of them is a pillow full of feathers. And at a certain moment in the show, it explodes. It, make an, it, it makes an enormous um, sound of explosion. And all the feathers come out. And you can interpret it in many ways, but one of the ways is you could say it's it's uh, an ode to imagination to dreaming to yeah to 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 fantasize but of course with the bombs bomb explosions in paris it suddenly got an another connotation and when we did the premiere in brussels 3 weeks ago we were wondering oh my god mm -hmm. if we do this during the show maybe some people in the audience might get very afraid. Uh, so we were really thinking, should we, should we say something about that? Um, uh, we, we actually, yeah, it, the, the effect of the explosion in the show is supposed to be a surprise effect. So we were a bit um, doubtful about what to do really. Um, still we decided to hang little posters on the wall uh, of the doors when, en when people entering on the doors um, saying that for safety, uh, well, for, s for feelings of feeling at ease, we felt um, obliged, not but uh, more, s yeah, we felt like we should say that there, that there is an explosion in the show. Um, in the end, we had eight shows, no one made a remark. Um, the effect ha was the effect that we wanted to. There were no complaints. But, of course, this kind of things make you think. And we didn't think about this 16 years ago, not at all. At that time, it was just an, a surprise effect. Whereas now, we were aware of the extra connotation it might evoke to the audience. So in that sense, yeah, we, we are influenced. I mean, this is one example. Of course, we are very aware of what it means to, to we, we work in Molenbeek and everyone in the world knowing that we work in Molenbeek, of our partners of the festivals and theaters presenting us, they were writing mails like, are you okay? How is it in uh, in this uh, yeah place? Um, and as a joke, we answered most of the time. We answered, well, 
at this moment we actually think it's the safest place to be because uh well who who was going to uh I mean, with you know with the problem being there uh, there would not be a problem in Molenbeek, if you know what i mean uh, maybe I, I don't express myself very well i have to say uh, the story from yesterday one of the dancers went to uh, uh how to uh, how to say discover nightlife in prague and uh, he told us, well, he felt much more afraid on the streets of Prague than in of Molenbeek, which... <laughs> well, but uh, you also change your day-to-day -day, uh, work in, uh, in the studio, you know, you, you, no. on, on, you uh, open the rehearsals, and this is something yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah, but the work in itself, we we just continued working. The two days of the Brussels lockdown, um, we sent a message. It was the lockdown star started in the weekend, so that was not a problem because we were not working in the weekend that weekend. But it would continue on Monday and Tuesday of the following week. We didn't know yet how long, but we knew it would be one Monday, Tuesday for sure. So we sent them a mail to all our dancers saying that um, that this was a situation in in Brussels, if they would not know it yet, of course they all knew already, and that we would just continue working. Uh, most of them come by bike or by foot, that was okay. If some of them would come by public transport, we, we told them to take a taxi, we would reimburse the taxi. They were all there, we just continued working, we made jokes, we made jokes when we were trying to explode the bomb, because we thought, oh, you, you, maybe... <laughs> That will be strange, but no problem. No one told us anything, not even the neighbors. Um, so in that sense, we just continued working as we had always done. But of course, the feeling of the, the project that we have um, uh, uh, next to the artistic project that we have, we actually have three programs next to the artistic program, which is a social artistic program it's a support to young choreographers, and it's an educational program. So we felt that we should reinforce the social artistic program and be aware that being in contact with people of Molenbeek, children and youngsters, it could be a, a chance or an opportunity, as we always believed, we would but we just wanted to continue to, to work on that and to communicate, to exchange, to to talk about things and not live in an isolated um, position, just to open the doors and keep them open. So I think it's also important to uh, mention that we also changed the strategy of rehearsals already uh, when you moved to Molenbeek that uh, uh, before he said, I would never allow anybody to observe the creative process before it is finished. Now, how it is, it's really that uh, the rehearsals are open and everybody from the street can come to see it? Uh. But in principle, they can, but at the same time, I mean, it, it's not that suddenly it's now so different as from before. Mm. We do work with schools in Molenbeek, and um, as I mentioned before, schools in Molenbeek, um, are very often what we call concentration schools, which means that uh, the population uh, in the schools is is very colored. So there are a lot of Moroccan uh, children and um, African children. Um, they come to our. We have se we have uh, concrete structural collaborations with some of the schools in Molenbeek, who work with Sepa Bayans. Uh, um, who is one of our collaborators, also someone who makes work, and we have produced it, but he also works with these schools, and he they rehearse in our studio. So they come to our studio with their teachers, they see how we work. We do other projects with them outside of the school. We did one project um, last June with them in a public space during a festival uh, for children in another part of Brussels, and we gave them all t-shirts of Ultima Ves. And um, it was very funny because they, they came 
to rehearse for that project, and they asked us, uh, are you also from Ultima Ves? Mm -hmm. And we said, yeah, we also work for Ultima Ves, and they proudly showed their T-shirt, and they said, we too. <laughs> so they felt like identifying with Ultima Ves and going out of the context of the studio as well to another part of Brussels and teach the material they had learned from <coughs> our dancers to an audience in the street. That was the project at that time. So we also realized that that's something that can work, that it can go in two directions, that it can be an exchange and that people can, children or people in general can identify with something they can understand as um, something that can make them stronger in, in thinking about themselves and thinking about their bodies and thinking about how they can communicate with other people. And hopefully they, they bring this further on they, to, to their families, to their brothers and sisters. So yeah, these are things that we, the, the, the events have made that we are probably more conscious of this now. So in, for instance, in this piece, the, the dancers mostly are academically educated, as we could see, in or at least... Speak low if you speak loud. Yes. No? Are they, they, they here? Are they here? <laughs> Some of They're warming up, no. probably. Yeah. Um, Wim works with all kinds of people, I would mm. say. Um, the dancers in this piece, it's true that they are rather trained. They have a, a dance background. But Wim has made some many... Some of them classical, even. Yeah, if some of them classical. That was the purpose for this piece. But Wim has made work like Talk to the Demon mm, yeah. uh, or other work where people have no dance background. Um, I remember, the in I think, in Booty Looting, there was a guy who was passing the studio every day. And this fat That's guy. That's Yasin. Yasin, yeah. He was in... Talk no, to the demon. And, uh, but uh, was another it another one? Another one, <laughs> maybe. Maybe yeah, I, I think I had the story that it was like a really strong guy who is who was just every day passing the studio, and one day he turned into the door and ended up. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's actually. Uh, I think you refer to the old man of ninety-two, yeah. who lives in our streets. Yeah, you will. You can see him in some of the images that follow. Um, so Seppa Bayans, the young choreographer who um, leads a lot of the uh, uh, educational and social artistic programs we do, has made a piece with 11 performers between 8 years old and 92 years old. And his idea was to, to, to use the theme of the um, intergenerational intergener working or living together as a starting point for his work. So he, he deliberately wanted to work with people of all ages, children and old people. And this old man lives in our streets, just actually basically in front of our um, studio. So all these different people entering and coming out and in out of our door and asked what is happening there. And Seppe Bayan said, yeah, it's, it's a dance studio. And he said, ah, okay. And Seppe invited him and said, well, if you feel like you can take your training and pass by one day. And the next day, he stood there. <laughs> and two days later, he was uh, involved in the piece. <laughs> we are also thinking about bringing him, because mm -hmm. he can travel still, the o old guy. Ah, he's... Uh, more alive than <laughs> <laughs> than, a, than any one of uh, of the rest of the company. Mm -hmm. Now, he, for him, it's like when we ask him, we even do two shows sometimes a day of that piece, which we would never ask our professional dancers to do. And uh, when we ask him, is it okay? And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, for me it's fine. The more, the better. <laughs> uh, I can tour still for many years. But he's really, you will see him uh, on the in, in the images. He's very alive. So we can maybe uh, show the short film yeah. without Maybe sound. a little explanation. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it's made by Peter Kruger. He's um, 
a filmmaker, documentary maker in Brussels, and um, he wanted to, to make a documentary on, the title is The Media Storm That Passed Brussels and the Silence That Followed. And the images speak for itself. So it's basically about the first question, is Brussels uh, a dead, uh, is, is, it a, is it a head hell hole? Is it dead? Is it um, terrible to live there? Or is the whole image or perception that is alive now just uh, put in scene? Is it just not a reality, but a scene? That's the question he asks in, in this documentary. Okay, so it's quite theatrical. How, how the city can change to be, uh, in fact, for media, it's a th sort of like theater, not reality. Okay, so maybe it's the time for questions, if you have any. Is there somebody who would like to ask something? Yeah. Uh, I will repeat. How now. was created the name of the company? Did you know that it's Spanish, it means the last time, but uh, why a Flemish or Belgian company has a Spanish name? Uh, I wonder if for ten people. I will repeat it to microphone. It, uh, the, the question was why does Belgian Flemish company use the Spanish name Ultima Ves, which means the last thing? Um, well, contemporary dance all over the world, I think, and in Belgium very much, is a very international thing. All um, dance co in contemporary dance companies in, in Flanders and Brussels and Wallonie have dancers from all over the world. Um, so when Wim founded his own company. He had actually, he came from a period of touring with Jan Fabre, The Power of Theatrical Madness, which had, had been touring for three years all over the world. And during this tour, Wim was one of the performers, uh, Wim got to know many people. Uh, one of them, a Mexican uh, artist living in Madrid. So when he thought of realizing his own ideas and making his own shows, he started in Madrid. Uh, he asked this Mexican person to organize an audition in Madrid. He, Octavio was his name, he did that. So the first dancers from Ultima Vez were Spanish people. And Wim didn't speak Spanish at the time, so Octavio had to translate. And very often Wim would tell Octavio to say to the people, can you ask him to do, to do that movement another time or a last time, and in Spanish that means por la última vez. He didn't understand, so he asked uh, Octavio, what does it mean? Um, so he explained him, and on the one hand he liked the sound of it, but also it corresponded very much with his vision and philosophy about movement and life. Um, one of his important themes at that time was what happens if you are in a situation of danger, something happens, you have to react. Maybe some of you have seen What the Body Does Not Remember, the very first piece of rim that was also performed here, in which performers, performers throw with bricks and another one catches it or pulls away someone else, otherwise the stone would fall on his head. So this theme of what, to be in a dangerous situation and to have to react almost by intuition or a catastrophe would happen, an explosion would happen. So, well, it's, this was at that time and still is a, a, um, at the heart of his vision on life, on performance, on movement. And for those reasons and maybe other ones that we don't know that were unconscious, he chose the title Ultima Veth. In the meantime, it's the name of the company for more than 25 years, almost uh, 30 next year. Voilà. But we are... S <laughs> yeah. That's fans of the company over there. <laughs> okay. So. I have to translate it to microphone. 
uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, the question was what uh, you do with the kids, what kind of movement you teach them? Um, when we talk about Ultima Vest vocabulary, it's not about a technique. It's not like classical ballet or Cunningham or modern dance. Um, the, 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 the it's not really a technique. It's a way of thinking about movement. It's, um, it's a philosophy about communication. Uh, it's also very theatrical or more theatrical than pure dance. So when we work with children, we work with context. We work with communication. We work with this theme that I mentioned when explaining the title. What does it mean if I touch someone like that? It causes a movement in the other person. What does it mean? So that's how we work with them. It's um, sometimes also when Wim, Wim himself, he has um, made shows with children as well. I'm not sure how many people here have seen Talk to the Demon, the piece we pr represented here um, <laughs> <laughs> one year ago. <laughs> Only one person, <laughs> several people. So he, he includes them in his work. He gives them a place, he gives them a role. He makes them responsible for what they do. In Talk to the Demon, you can almost say he made them the masters of the stage or the scene. They, they sort of decided what happens. But there, there are different ways. Um, sometimes we, we learn them, yeah, to, 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 to move. I mean, to, of course, movement itself is also one of the working points. Another question? Somebody? Maybe you're also so curious to know if we are still going to continue working with you <laughs> as a musician. Okay, <laughs> okay. so, <laughs> well, the question was uh, what... Uh, I have to say to microphone because it's recorded, so... Uh, the question was, well, Ultima Ves exists for 30 years. You spoke about the history of 30 years. Do you think that uh, the future will be another 30 years? And what, how it is connected to uh, Molenbeek? Well, we always look ahead for the next four to five years. That's more or less the period. We have just uh, in applied for a new grant in October last year. Uh, if we, in June this year, we will know if we still get subventions. And if we do, we can work for another five years until 2021. So yes, we have in the dossier put many projects we want to do. Um, creations, uh, projects with children, projects with Molenbeek, pro uh, educational projects, films, um, a book, um, an opera. Uh, voilà. There are still projects for the coming five years, so from January 2017 till uh, December 2021, which is the period of the next subvention round. <laughs> the minister will decide in June if that will happen or not. <laughs> it's important to say that uh, Wim is also making the films and his new film, uh, which is called Galloping Minds, Galloping Galloping Minds. Uh, is, uh, was selected for uh, Karlovy Vary Festival. So first week of June, uh, July, uh, we all meet in Carlo Vivari, probably, yeah? <laughs> to see it. Yeah. And the sister of Wim is making a documentary about Wim and Ultima Ves that will be released on the 24th of April on f uh, Flemish television. And then from then on, probably also on other uh, broadcast networks or festivals that will present it. So this is also the 
question for us if we should not do mm -hmm. the, the projections of Galloping Minds as well as this film. I would suggest you to see the previous one, which was actually part of, uh, of the show Monkey Sandwich, which was here and then transformed into a film uh, called Monkey Sandwich. And especially for the students of theater, the first part of the film is essential. If you decide to be actor or theater director, you have to see this film and maybe you will change your mind. <laughs> In fact, the DVD box with most of the films of Wim, I have seen it. Yeah, we still sell it on uh, in the box office, so that's a chance to buy the, the other films, but not Monkey Sandwich is not included. But if you want, we can make special projection in the in following month for you on demand. The show of tonight is about love. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is more for Czechs. Oh. So the question was about participation of uh, people of color into the process because we here, even here, our discussion is uh, mostly for uh, white color people and not the not the people of different nationalities and nation uh, and ethnic uh, background. Uh, so how people from Molenbeek are involved in the artistic process? Yeah, that's a very good question, of course. Um, from the barman. From the barman. Um, when we moved to Molenbeek, um, well, as I said before, Wim has worked with many nationalities all these years. Uh, in the artistic crew, he chooses people for artistic qualities, depending on the project he does. Um, Talk to the Demon, for example, the Moroccan dancer living uh, in Molenbeek participated for the first time and participates again now in In Spite of Wishing and Wanting, the piece we have just revived. We have also included uh, someone from Molenbeek into our fixed crew. Uh, he's Moroccan. But of course, um, and, and in the piece Talk to the Demon, there were two um, African um, people. Um, for sure, the art world in, in Belgium is still very white. Uh, it's an issue we talk about in Belgium as well. Um, I think there is still a long road to go to be conscious of that. Um, it's it's a, a matter of emancipation on many different levels, I think, uh, as much as the emancipation of women in our society is still going on as well. Um, that's also an issue we have to be stay aware of. Um, but yeah, we have color in our company. Yeah, well, actually, the first piece we presented here was mountain made of barking, and uh, uh, the principal actor, a uh, principal dancer of. Uh, of the show was uh, Moroccan, a blind, uh, blind Moroccan, uh, Brussels-based person, yeah, yeah. and performer. Yeah. Okay, so. But, yeah. Yeah. Yes.
Okay, so the question was, what if ministry would not support Ultima West for the future? If uh, what uh, Ultima West would do without the support of the political and financial elite? Uh, for sure, Ultima West would change. I cannot say if Ultima West would stop working, because it would need a very big exercise to think about the way we would continue working if we would decide for that. But for sure it would change. Why? Because um, the subvention from the Flemish community, because we're actually uh, subventioned by the Flemish community, uh, is 50% or almost 50% or let's say close to 50% of our total budget. So to do it with half of the money we have would be very difficult and the main problem is also that if we would not have the subvention, I mean the rest of our budget is the um, income is uh, consisting out of the, the touring, the touring and the co-production money that we receive from our partners in order to create a piece. So, um, the, the of course, we have it's a global budget, but let's say if we would not have the subvention anymore, we would not have money anymore to have a building and to have a fixed crew of people working in the office doing administration, finances, communication, tour management, production, etc., etc., the technical people, would uh, that would be problematic then, to have people full-time on the contract in order to guarantee a stable, continuous functioning of the company. So that would become very problematic, and also the making and the creating of work. So I cannot answer. I mean, um, I seriously hope uh, we will still get received a subvention. And that's not only, it would not only be problematic for Ultima Vest, it would be problematic for every company in Flanders, be it uh, dance, theater, music, um, scenic, um, um, opera, um, or sculpture art. Uh, the subventions form a, an, an important part of the budget, always. Even if in dance, we do generate a lot of own income, thanks to our touring and our um, um, possibilities to have co-production amounts, uh, but still the subvention is very, very important in our global functioning. Actually, this is the same situation for Arca Theatre. We also are dependent on, on the subsidy of the city with the same 50% of the budget, so we also have to generate another 50%. And uh, we had with Wim the, the other night, we had a discussion on that because he was quite scared. Uh, he, he was very worried about the situation in, in Belgium, about the subsidies for culture and so on. And we ended up that, well, there is always a way to go back to underground. <laughs> so, so we will probably not have this beautiful theater. We will not probably but uh, have the possibilities to do big events, but uh, we will not stop to do our things. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so maybe there is a chance for the last question because we have to also make the, uh, the our friends from uh, Dresden arrived and they are thirsty and they, they are hungry. And <laughs> So, so we have the audience not only from Prague, but uh, also from Dresden. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, so this is the chance for the last question. So two, two last questions. A last question, okay, so. <laughs> so. This was a joke. <laughs> S 
So the other question. The question yeah. Maybe you, you can repeat the question because it's just for the microphone. Do you ask your question about gender and how it changed in the last 30 years re, uh, on the level of, of the artistic creation or the management uh, level? Because I'm not Wim van de Kebus and mm. I, I, if it's about artistic creation, uh, I would give the micro to one of our artists here. I would prefer to... Um, but can you specify your question? Because I'm not sure if I understand. It's like it's always been this um, fight or women-generated women conflicts. Um, in the work of Wim van der Kebes, you mean? Huh? For example, in his last talks, well, in his current work, I mean, about women who get so much stronger, for example, in the music field. So Yeah. <laughs> I find it difficult to say as a general thing or as a statement. Uh, Wim makes the work he makes in the moment he makes it. <laughs> at that time of his life, at that time of society, um, we have just like three weeks ago, we revived in spite of wishing and wanting. This is the first time, so 16 years ago it was the first time and it has remained the only time so far that Wim worked with an exclusive, exclusively male cast. And um, at that time we realized, and again we realize it now seeing the piece, that the fact that he works with male dancers only gives a difference in the, um, the quality and also in the, the theme of conflict or not, because the conflict between men and women is not apparent, uh, is not present in that piece. S but there is something else. But to now to say that, um, or to describe, or to say something about how in the in the years the gender conflict in his work has developed, I would rather uh, give that to a university student and make that person. I can. I don't know if that's if we if I can say something consistent about that. Sorry, <laughs> if any of my colleagues here can has an opinion about that, they I th I can speak. I think uh, uh, definitely Wim has a very positive relation to women. That's that's we can. <laughs> I, he he does not value women over men or men yeah, over yeah, women. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, men uh, women are very strong personages in his work. Yes, from the beginning, what the body does not remember. Uh, you had the, the famous frisking scene, whereby um, frisking what you have in the airport that you get frisked. Yeah. Yeah. And um, at the first sight, you could think, oh, he's de uh, developed it in, in the classical cliche way, because it's the women who get frisked by men. But as the scene, that particular scene develops, you discover that the women dictate the movements more than the men and that the men become followers of the movements of the women rather than women being dominated by, by the, the male dancers. And for tonight, I mean, s some it's very subjective, I would say also. Um, you can see one thing in it and you can see another thing in it. It depends on which perspective you have. But that's maybe interesting in the frame of the whole thing, what we are talking about now, that which perspective do you take? How do you look at it? Uh, but there are many, many perspectives possible, I would say. Some scenes may be um, revolting for some men or women regarding the other sex or the way that the conflict is yes or not provoked, but that can turn easily in another scene. It's not one thing or another, I would say. It's all. And it's up to every one of us to, to ask questions about what you really see. And if you see what you think you see. But yeah, that's always one of the um, uh, interesting things in the work of Wim, that he plays with this and that he plays with fiction and reality and the um, 
the gap between them or the uh, the um, relation between them he he really he can put you on one leg and in the next moment you fall because you're on the wrong leg <laughs> and but that's nice also in booty looting for example he played a lot with the idea of um, um, is this reality or not he was creating the images on the scene on the spot you could you could witness as an audience you could witness the creation of an image which then you would see projected a few seconds later on the screen and you would realize there that that what you had seen being created as an image was not what you saw on the screen and that made you think a lot about that aspect of what does it mean to create an image which is again at the beginning of our talk was was the theme what do, what do the media do they do nothing else but creating images it's never no one um, ever sees what the picture shows no one everyone has a different perspective or sees a different image in reality but the media show us one thing so yeah i mean it's an um, it's very present in his work and there are a number of themes that reoccur in his work and sometimes they are more present in certain shows than in other shows um, here again it's true that the theme of men women is very present but not in a one-dimensional way i would say we just added uh, there was a all-female cast in uh, a scratching in a field so it's 50 uh, 50 in <laughs> Uh, in a balance, uh, gender balance. There is a last question, and we have to uh, let the barman for his question. Uh, so, do some uh, orders then to to barmans after this. So, the last question. Okay, so the question is about internship in the company. If uh, young dancers or choreographers can ask for the internship to observe the work and creative process. Uh, we have offered that opportunity already and we will do in the future. On the other hand, we also want to protect the dancers that participate in a creation because they give themselves 200% and during creation, they need also uh, the, in the, the, um, the, s the safety of an intime environment in order to go very far and try out things that in the end will not be in the show, but that, w that are developed in the, during the creation process. So it's not that we, uh, that we can give place to everybody in such a uh, in the context of a creation process. But during ins the revival of In Spite of Wishing and Wanting, for example, we had three um, interns, uh, two men and one woman, and we found it a bit strange that the school whom we were working with or in Paris uh, had sent the woman, but she became the mascot of all our da male dancers, so it was great. By the way, maybe that was the last question. I want yeah. to, um, apart from the subventions, thank all our performers whom you will see tonight on the stage because apart from the money, which we of course also need, but we basically uh, first of all need uh, people to make the work with and who, um, artists who perform the work and who create it with, together with women. But now they're all gone already, I see. They're probably warming up. So um, enjoy the show of tonight and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I made a selection, the best 
uh, uh, question was from the bar, please go to the bar and uh, you can ask some questions about uh, the, their repertory.